Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, once again, welcome to everybody. And a thanks again to the health ministry at the hospital for, for joining in and, and, uh, and making this part of, of your meeting as well. Um, as everybody knows, with, that's doing any kind of uh, health ministry in any way, shape, or form, we've had quite a time during the pandemic trying to get the information out to our churches, to our community on different health subjects. We've had drive-through dinners and drive-through health fairs even, and um, doing the, the flu shots uh, down in, in the lesbian everything. But we really want to um, start to do more, if we can, to try to get the word out about different things, especially during COVID. Um, so one of the big things that we learned during COVID uh, was that people have a lot of questions about the vaccines, the different vaccines and, and, um, and, and all. So we've, we've turned a lot of um, the questions over to Dr. Folsom. And in that, she has developed a, a, a talk with uh, some slides. Uh, we, will, we are recording this for, for the, the cloud right now, mm -hmm. uh, but we will, you know, should we need to show it again in the future, we will work on getting that to other people as well that may not have been able to join. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Elder. Very good. Um, so let me just really quickly hit the share screen button. <laughs> Um, I do want to make this fairly interactive. So I did create a PowerPoint presentation and it does have about 28 to 30 slides. Some of them we can go through fairly quickly. Um, but if anybody has questions, they can put them in the chat box or um, we will have time at the end, uh, hopefully for a questions and answers session. Um, as, as you mentioned before earlier, uh, we're probably going to go ahead and mute everyone just so that it, you know, kind of decreases background noise. And then obviously when I'm done, we'll go ahead and um, unmute everybody if that's okay. So let me hit that. And then um, I'm gonna hit the share screen button. And I just want to do this one. Okay, let me just make sure that this is the right one. This is not the right one. So hold on one second. Ah. I apologize for the delay. Of course, my computer is not acting very nice. Okay. All right, share screen. We are good. Can you see this? <laughs> yes, good. Okay. Um, so I am going to turn it into um, this mode. So this is about COVID-19 vaccinations predominantly. Um, I, I do, I wanted to give a little bit of background about COVID-19 in general. So um, I, I just want to let you guys know that there'll be just a couple quick slides on that. So the very first thing is that obviously COVID-19 became um, a real major issue for us in 2000, late 2019 and here in the United States, 2020. Uh, symptoms do include coughing, shortness of breath, loss of taste and smell, uh, fever, sore throat, runny nose, congestion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, body aches and chills. So sort of a general background, it can look a lot like any other viral illness, um, which is why it has been so hard for us to, um, to really be able to rein it in uh, as much as we would like. Um, the, the picture up here on the top is um, one of the pictures that you can see from like an electron micrograph. micrograph. And then this down at the bottom shows the cellular uh, structure of the coronavirus. Uh, and you can see that there are multiple proteins that stick out from the, from the virus, and that's what's recognized by our system. It's going to be important to keep in mind that those proteins are what really are important for the development and the progression of vaccine manufacturing and production in this country. From a testing strategy, uh, the most important thing to understand is that in general, uh, if someone is sick, they should be tested. Um, the best test is usually a PCR test, which is that send out test. Uh, thankfully right now, uh, the turnaround time for those is very, very quick. Usually within about 24 to 48 hours, we're actually getting those back. Um, gen in general, if you get an antigen test, which is a rapid antigen test, it's a quicker answer, but it's not as reliable. And so there are a higher rate of what we call false negatives where um, you know, you may have symptoms, but it says that you're negative and then you send off a PCR and it, it ends up being positive. 
Antibody testing is generally not used very frequently, except for those who are planning on donating blood or serum for, um, for treatment strategies. Also, some people have used it to determine if they are still protected at various points, but in general, we do not use antibody testing very frequently. Treatment strategies, uh, we are very thankful that we now have some treatment strategies that we did not have just you know, one short year ago. Um, we have outpatient monoclonal antibody therapy. Uh, we do have the opportunity to treat people with steroids and remdesivir, which is an antiviral therapy. And um, of course, if people progress and they need supportive care like oxygenation and ventilation, um, at, with an artificial means of that. Obviously, we have that ability. Uh, there is some discussion about going ahead and putting people on an aspirin uh, treatment um, uh, for various populations to reduce clotting um, that can happen as a result of COVID-19. Um, that is still not a mainstay of treatment, but many doctors uh, will recommend that. I did want to put in a few statistics slides, of course, people sometimes glaze over when we get to statistics, but in general, um, what we try to track uh, every Wednesday, we sort of calculate out our statistics. We have an epidemiologist at the health department who does this for us, thankfully, um, but she sort of house, uh, pulls out the information from what we've gathered and uh, she reports to us these statistics. So. Um, you can see that just you know four short weeks ago we had you know double the double plus uh, the cases the total number of cases than what we've seen in this past week. You can also see here that the age range is quite disparate in terms of who is being affected. Um, so right now we are still seeing uh, a large population in those younger children, and then in general we've always seen that the workforce has been uh, or the working age uh, people in our community have probably had the highest rates of COVID positivity. Down below, this is our, uh, our percent positivity rate. And so you can see that that likewise has, can change based on what um, you know, your age range is. Right now and for the past, I would say six weeks, the highest percent positivity has been in our zero to 14 year olds, a zero, you know, our, our young kids. Um, just last week, it was 13%. So it's already sort of been cut in half this week. Um, but as we all know, kids are going back to school. And so we may start to see some isolated events with that. Uh, but in general, our numbers are looking much better than just where we were, you know, four short weeks ago. Uh, this slide um, is also a statistical slide that our epidemiologist provides for us. But um, it's sort of superimposed our positivity rate with our testing numbers. So you can see these are our overall testing numbers and our percent positivity rate. So you can see that uh, basically over the past four weeks, things have gone down. We have had a my slight reduction in the number of people getting tested, uh, but overall our percent positivity has remained the same. Um, and then you can see over here on this slide, just our general positivity rate for our total population. The slide before I sort of went through by age, this is our total population uh, in terms of the percent positivity. Um, okay, so COVID impacts our community in many ways. Uh, there are people who have symptoms, there are people who have no symptoms, but everybody can transmit for up to 48 hours prior to the symptom onset or when they test positive. Uh, it can create severe illness, causing hospitalizations uh, and the long hauler uh, people who have chronic lung or heart disease as a result of it, or may develop clots um, in their lungs or their legs. Uh, obviously we have had deaths in our community and across the nation. Uh, and that's a very unfortunate reality of any new viral illness, but in particular, this one has hit us quite hard. And then of course, um, all the things that follow as a trickle down effect from quarantining and isolation. So lost revenue for people who work, um, lost time in the schools for children, um, shutting down parts of daycares or veterinary offices or medical offices, uh, hair salons, restaurants. These are all places where um, we understand that quarantining people and keeping people from being able to work really can impact the bottom line for many, many people, not only monetarily, but you know, for veterinary offices, if your dog's sick, you need to get your dog there. For medical offices, you need to be seen. So we really, um, we know that it impacts us in many, many ways. Uh, just a brief cursory overview. I always put this slide in when I'm talking about vaccination. So just as a reminder, I know every, most people know this, but 
what we are talking about with vaccinations is that we want to do primary prevention before we even get into the people who are ill or severely ill. Um, so this is our you know, primary prevention model and vaccinations have long been a way of preventing disease um, for many, many diseases. So these slides are not my own uh, in terms of the pictures. The pictures are beautiful, but they are cut and pasted from New York Times and I've hyperlinked them here. So when you send out the PowerPoint, uh, people can see the reference there. Um, so the, two, the types that are out right now are called mRNA vaccinations. Uh, we have two that are on the market that have been FDA approved for emergency use authorization, and they are Pfizer and Moderna. Both are a two-part series. Pfizer is split by 21 days at minimum. Moderna is 28 days at minimum. The Moderna vaccination was studied up to 42 days. We do know that there's a little, little bit of wiggle room. So if somebody misses their 28 day mark, which is many of the questions that come into the health department is if I don't get it right on day 28, is it still gonna be good? So we know that at least for 42 days afterwards for what Moderna studied, it's efficacious. It's likely effective even after that. We know that the nature of most vaccines, you know, you don't wanna wait six months, but if you're at the six to seven week mark, because you had something else going on, it's probably not gonna affect the efficacy. But the studies kind of have to be, you know, that short window. Um, essentially the only thing in these vaccinations is a bunch of fat molecules and this mRNA. And this mRNA is a blueprint that tells our body how to create a protein. Um, I was talking to one of our local pediatricians today, Dr. B Dr. Beer Singh, and he said what he's been telling his, you know, patients, the parents um, of some of these children is that he thinks of this as a blueprint for how to build a door on a house. Okay, so we're building a door on a house. If that house goes into our body, our body recognizes the door and it says, we don't need this house in here. So it's just one component of a larger picture. You can see over here on this slide, this portion of the slide with the bigger picture, that essentially our cells sort of absorb that mRNA molecule, that mRNA starts creating these proteins and then the proteins can go out on our cells and then our, our immune system can sort of uh, read those uh, proteins and create antibodies. The J&J &J adenovirus vaccination, which is not yet to market, but is uh, expected to be uh, approved by the FDA, if not already, I can't remember if they're going tomorrow, um, but anyways, this is an inactivated uh, uh, virus that carries a DNA molecule for that spike protein, okay? It does enter our cells and it enters into our nucleus, but it cannot replicate. It does not have the machinery to replicate internally. And it does eventually produce the mRNA that then leads to that door being created. So that protein being created from that mRNA. So it adds basically one extra step to the Pfizer and Moderna products. It has that DNA molecule that goes to mRNA that then goes to the protein. Um, oh, both vaccines create an immune response. So as a reminder, and, and you know, I sometimes have to go back to basic biology myself, but we have T cells and B cells. Oops, B cells are the ones that create antibodies and T cells um, do a vast number of other activities for our immune system. And we have immediate B and T cell responses as well as memory B and T cell responses. So just keep in mind that the goal is to create a long lasting um, uh, response, but also, you know, you're gonna have an immediate reaction as well. So these T cells and B cells work together to create these antibodies that can fight if we are seeing the virus um, spread to ourselves an exposure. The efficacy data is much, much higher for the mRNA vaccinations from what we can gather. Uh, the studies that were done from Moderna and Pfizer uh, show basically a 94 to 95% efficacy after two doses at reducing symptomatic disease. And by virtue of that, we would assume that it also will lead to a reduced likelihood of transmission. Uh, so if one has fewer symptoms or is maybe not symptomatic at all, the goal is that that will likely reduce your viral load and you will then transmit to fewer people. Um, it also uh, reduces the severity of illness. The adenovirus vaccinations 
boast um, after one dose, okay, so that's the important part is that this is a one part shot series for adenovirus. Uh, we know that that will reduce severity of illness. And you can see over here in this little snippet, oops, that uh, Johnson & Johnson on their own website has that it's a 72% effective effectiveness rate in the United States. And then they did do um, international studies and it's 85% effective overall in preventing severe disease and it demonstrated complete protection against hospital, uh, hospitalization and death as of day 28 after vaccination. So quite um, robust uh, efficacy for both of these vaccinations. And what we need to keep in mind, I was on an ethics committee uh, meeting yesterday with the hospital and, and the health department. And there were a bunch of other um, people on board. But one of the things that we have to keep in mind is the quicker we can get people vaccinated, the less likely we are to have mutations of these strains that would become a problem for us. So anything that's gonna expedite that process, we would welcome with open arms. And whether, whether or not that's increased production of the ones that are already authorized, or if it's creating more and more technology with new types of vaccines, both of those efforts would be um, welcomed. Uh, so we have how I put, I put in here, how is the state doing? I know we're, you know, we're sort of talking about this little enclave of Calvert County that we have here, but the state as a whole is doing a pretty good job. It's administered as of last night when I was um, updating the stats uh, slides, it has administered over a million doses and um, the majority of them are first dose allotments. And obviously that, that makes sense. We didn't really start vaccinating until the very tail end of December and many people we picked up sort of towards the end of January and into early February. We are technically in phase 1C. I will talk to you later about what Calvert has chosen to do thus far. Um, the state has sort of said, you know, our goal is to get everybody vaccinated in all of these 1A, 1B, 1C groups. Um, and so that's a large group of our population. How's Calvert doing? We're doing pretty darn good. Uh, I think, um, you know, overall our numbers look quite good. We have, um, pop we have vaccinated about 14% of our population. Uh, and if you take into account that um, a significant portion of our population has already had the illness at some point and likely carry some protection, um, you probably are getting somewhere closer to maybe 30% or 40% of our population having some protection. And again, the new strains of the virus, you know, it remains to be seen if you're going to be fully protected, both with the vaccine and illness for that. Um, and then you can see also over here that the actual numbers of how many people we've vaccinated. So we have vaccinated 13,312 uh, people in our county. And then there's been um, about 5,000, a little over 5,000 second dose vaccinations given at this point. A little bit of a busy slide, but I took this directly off of the state of Maryland's website. Um, you obviously have to scroll down on the website on this. I'm trying to sort of put these things side by side. So technically we are in phase 1C. That means that all 1A, 1B and 1C eligible people technically are supposed to be vaccinated. Um, phase 1A, we have gotten uh, through all of those people that we know of. We've at least offered the vaccine to the group 1A people at least once, um, if not more than that. So that's healthcare workers, first responders, public safety, corrections, and residents and staff of nursing homes uh, and assisted living facilities. Phase 1B includes the individuals in our community that have intellectual or developmental disabilities, people in assisted living or group living congregate settings, people 75 and above, and then education and continuity of government. So in general, our goal right now in Calvert County is to try to prioritize this group of people to the very best of our ability. Um, it means that we have a disproportionate group of people that are 65 to 74 that are seeking desperately to get vaccinated. And we understand that that is the case, uh, but we do know that the death rate in those who are over 75 and with some of these other um, situations where you're in a congregate living setting, your illness will spread potentially like wildfire to other people. And it could have potentially a devastating effect on those that you live with in those communal settings. So we have sort of leaned towards prioritizing that group. Um, 
we will get to 1C, it's just a matter of time. And we have vaccinated some people in that 65 to 74 year old group, uh, but it's just not what we're sort of striving for right now uh, with the allotments that we're getting. One of the questions that I got, which is a great question because it's a question that we ask all the time, uh, why were the tiers opened up uh, so quickly? And there's no great answer for that. Uh, what I would say is that um, likely there were settings in the state where there may have been a need to open up to larger populations or larger groups. Some of the smaller counties um, may have been able to get their 1A people vaccinated very quickly. Um, and then they needed to roll into those other groups. Um, and some people in very small counties uh, can easily get through their 1B population. So I, I understand that there's been some frustration both from people locally and at the state level. Um, but once the CDC sort of creates the guidance, it's, upon, it's put upon the state uh, people to sort of create and decide how they would want to proceed. And so they deemed that this is the best workflow to open up to every tier. I think what, one thing that they may not have been anticipating was that the supply would remain so insufficient. Um, and that's really the biggest hurdle that we're seeing at this time. We get 500 total doses a week for our population of about 70, 72,000 adults roughly um, in this county. And if you look at just our pre-registration database alone, uh, we had about 2,500, maybe a little, a little closer to 3,000 people 75 and over who pre-registered on that county database. And with 500 doses, if we're just even tackling those 75 and over, we're gonna slowly chip away, but it's gonna take about four to five weeks, maybe even a little bit longer, unless we get this windfall allotment at some point. So there's something to keep in mind there. So one of the other questions is how, what is the process? What is this process like for us? How do, maybe, maybe this is a good time to sort of talk about what we do behind the scenes. Uh, so every Monday, the health department uh, has a group of us that get together and talk about how many doses we have left, what we're anticipating, um, what our clinics look like for the week, um, who we might be inviting for that week, you know, back when it was predominantly healthcare workers, what we were doing to reach out to them. So we get together at least once weekly, if not more. Uh, tomorrow we're meeting again. So we met Monday and we're meeting again tomorrow. Uh, but we discuss this on a regular basis about all of these sort of nuts and bolts pieces. But the goal is to get every member who wants a shot registered on that database. And some people have argued that pre-registering doesn't, shouldn't, we shouldn't label it pre-registration, but essentially it's expressing that you would be interested when your name gets called, you would be interested to get vaccinated. So the website I've put there, for any members of your community that you might be in touch with or you know anything like that, please, you can have them call. If they don't have an email address and they need some help, we have that phone number there. That's the number that they can call and someone at the Calvert County government will be the one that helps sign them up. They will get a token, a ticket number and that's their proof that they have uh, signed up for that pre-registration database. And that's the number that will follow them uh, through that whole process. Unfortunately, because of the nature of mass vaccination emails, um, unfortunately, a lot of times these things may go to trash or spam folders. So it's something to keep in mind that if you're looking in your email, you're gonna have to continually sift through some of those things as well. Some people can look into the mass vaccination sites. I know that Six Flags and M&T Bank Stadium, I think are both on board for that. And I'm sure that there's others. Um, find appointments at pharmacies. This is a very difficult task, I understand. I spent about 30 minutes on the phone with one of the pharmacists that's doing vaccinations and they're running into many of the same problems and pitfalls that we've been sort of dealing with since day one at the health department. Um, so they get small allotments, generally somewhere between 100 and 150 allotments for the whole week. Um, and very similarly, they put together their plan for clinics going forward from there. So just something to kind of keep in mind. And then of course our hospital is partnering with us. Uh, they get some allotments themselves directly from the state. And then of course, as best we can, if we need um, uh, sort of to get to a pocket group of people 
Um, we ask that we partner with the hospital and the hospital has regularly been meeting with us as well once weekly. Uh, they have a team, we have a team, we meet. Um, so we combine to put our efforts into vaccinating some of the senior citizens in our community. One of the questions that I've seen repeatedly at, be asked was, should anyone not get vaccinated? So um, anyone who's had a prior anaphylactic reaction to a known COVID vaccination certainly should not get vaccinated. So if you've gotten your first dose, you had anaphylaxis, you did your EpiPen, you went to the emergency room, you should not get a second dose. If you're allergic to ingredients in the vaccine, it is technically a contraindication. So polyethylene glycol, long fat chains and sodium chloride are literally the only products in these mRNA vaccines. Um, the EUA statement for the Johnson & Johnson product has not been released yet, so I wasn't able to look to see what the ingredients were on that, but literally it's basically fat, PEG, and sodium chloride in the mRNA vaccinations. If you have received monoclonal antibody therapy in the 90 days prior, you should not get that, and that's because you have received antibodies to COVID yourself. And so that will make it a less, less efficacious um, vaccination. If someone is actively told to isolate or quarantine, they should not be coming through and getting vaccinated during that time. Um, as you can imagine, somebody could spread disease unknowingly to our staff or to other people at the sites. And then also it would be very difficult if someone were to develop side effects to determine whether or not that was from the vaccine or if it was from their potential exposure to a case. And then obviously uh, we cannot vaccinate anyone under 18 with the Moderna or under 16 with the Pfizer product. Many COVID vaccine side effects have been reported. The predominant ones that we hear are headaches, soreness at the injection site, redness of the skin surrounding um, the injection site, fever, chills, and usually those are mild and self-limited, and then fatigue. And they generally last about 24 to 48 hours. And the most important thing to keep in mind is that no vaccination for COVID should cause respiratory symptoms. So even though these symptoms I kind of listed on the beginning for COVID, um, if you ever develop any symptoms like respiratory distress or anything like that after a vaccination, that is not normal for the vaccine side effects. Many people have asked the question, how do these vaccines get pushed out so quickly? And there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy regarding this particular factor. So a couple of the stages in the trials were not done sequentially. So they ended up overlapping some of those stages, which gave them a much quicker timeline. Uh, they were still done completely, but they were done uh, overlapping rather than sequential. We had an overwhelming group effort from public and private sectors, both as it pertains to funding and support for research. So it was one of the biggest times I think, at least you know, in my 41 years, that I can think of a, two groups kind of coming together and saying, let's do this and let's sort of do this quickly. Also because the rates of COVID were high enough in our community, it was easier to prove efficacy when they looked at that data. So if you have a not a very common disease, it's much, much harder to prove that a vaccine is effective in a quicker period of time. But when COVID is as high as it was at various points of the clinical trials, it was very easy to quickly uh, determine uh, efficacy data. Some myths. So um, these, these myths are things that I commonly hear or that have been presented to me prior. Um, many people who have had COVID already don't feel that they need the vaccine. And while your natural immunity is certainly protective for 90 days after you've had COVID illness, we don't know yet if there is a benefit to just re relying on that antibody protection from your illness. So we think that you will likely get a much better response for your uh, immunity to get the vaccine. So most scientists would agree that it's best to go ahead and get that vaccine when you're done with your illness and you're feeling well enough, go ahead and get that vaccine if your name is called. We do know that some people get reinfected. So even if you had um, COVID before, 
uh, even without these new variant strains, people were getting reinfected. So we do know that that can happen. And then of course there are the new strains of COVID-19. It does appear that the Johnson & Johnson product probably has a better efficacy rate for the South African variant um, uh, because they were doing a portion of their international trials in South Africa, they could prove some of that efficacy, but uh, it remains to be seen about Pfizer and Moderna. COVID vaccination myth number two would be that the vaccination uh, was rushed and steps were skipped. We kind of talked about this already. Um, the mRNA vaccination technology platform has been around for over two decades. It's been studied in multiple other illnesses, including Zika, Ebola, um, MERS, SARS, the original SARS. Um, so those diseases, it was not proven to be efficacious for. And again, we talked about uh, government and private sectors. And then um, obviously the sequential nature was uh, cut short because they were doing overlapping um, as part of the trials. Now that I've been vaccinated, I won't need to worry about masks or social distancing or any of those protocols. And unfortunately, until we have a much larger group vaccinated, we will need to continue with efforts to mask wear, socially distance, wash our hands, um, reduce the amount of people in one tight space. Uh, so just be mindful that for the foreseeable future, masks are the way to go. I think once we have a larger group of our population vaccinated, it will be easier for us to, um, to lift some of those restrictions. The CDC did just update guidance to allow people who've been double vaccinated plus two weeks to not quarantine if they are exposed. So if I am exposed at work, I've been double vaccinated and it's been two weeks since my last dose. For the next 90 days, I don't have to quarantine as long as I remain without symptoms. I don't need to quarantine um, after a known exposure. So that's one of the newest guidance uh, pieces that came out within the last 10 days or so. As with most illnesses, people do believe that they can get the disease from the vaccine. And once again, we know that that is not possible with this vaccine as well as basically any other vaccination. All vaccinations are created with either a protein or a piece of the virus or a piece of something that is that your body is seeing and creating that immune response to. And obviously in this case, it's the same. Another thing that I've heard from a lot of um, religious organizations or from people who um, may have a propensity to be concerned about fetal cell lines, uh, they are not used in these products. So we don't need to worry about some of the concerns that are raised when we're talking about aborted fetal cell lines um, that might be present in other vaccinations. And then we, we've heard a really weird one, which is COVID vaccination causing infertility. Well, first of all, there's really no way we can document that in general. There's just, it's, it's very impossible to, to sort of track that. But what, what the theory was, was that this protein that is created, that spike protein, was this piece of the placental protein that is called syncytion one, um, which is, it's just been proven to be false. There's no cross reactivity there. So there's no likelihood that somebody who's gotten a vaccination will have an autoimmune response to their own placenta. So that doesn't happen. One question from, I think it was one of the questions that you shared with me um, was how do I get to show a letter from a doctor or verification that I have a medical condition? So at this moment, right now, as we're speaking, letters aren't necessary because we aren't yet to tier two. Tier two is gonna be for when people have medical issues for those 18 to 64 who have medical reasons that would put them at greater risk for death or complications from COVID-19. So at this point there, it's a moot point. Um, by the time we get to tier two, our hope at the health department, and it's been a big push from Dr. Polsky at the state level when he has his health officer meetings and such, is that we hope that the vaccines will be in the arms and the hands of the healthcare providers in our community who can correctly vaccinate and follow the people that need these most. Our doctors, speaking as a, a physician in the community for over 10 years, um, I can probably even still remember some of my patients who would have been at greatest risk, um, even though I haven't you know, seen them for a year, I can still remember some of those people that really would need this vaccination. So uh, doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants should really be put at the top of prioritizing 
for that next year uh, who needs to be vaccinated. But for right now, there's really no need to, to, to do a letter because there's really not anything that we're using to sort of parse those people out. So as I mentioned before, currently we get a total of about 500 doses per week from the state for first dose uh, vaccinations. We do get a separate shipment for our second dose allotment. So they know exactly how many they're accounting for uh, four weeks after those first doses. We have not been shortchanged on the second doses. So uh, one of the questions that I get a lot of times from people calling into the health department is, am I gonna be able to get my second dose? And so far we have not had a single issue with obtaining those aside from last week when this the ice storm blanketed a portion of the country and it was not related to um, actually manufacturing the vaccine, it was a matter of delivering it to our um, state and then our county. Some pharmacies are getting the vaccine directly from the federal government. So please keep in mind that those people are not getting the vaccine from the state allotment. So they're getting it directly from the federal government. I believe that CVS and Walgreens at this moment. I think Giant is and Safeway, those types of places are still getting it from the state. Uh, mass vaccination sites are using allocations for residents of the state. They also withhold a certain percentage for residents of that particular county, uh, but they also offer to all members of the state. So the Six Flags location, maybe they allocate 30% to the residents of PG County, but the remainder of them go to anybody in the state that, that gets an appointment. So that's why it can be kind of a all fend for yourself kind of thing. As I mentioned before, the county, we've, we've been able to reliably offer vaccination to all 1A groups at least. So it's been offered at least once. We've also offered to all school employees that includes um, bus drivers. It includes all of the subsets that are um, at the school. Um, I should say bus drivers that are permanent. I think some of the substitutes haven't been offered it, but in general, we've offered it to almost everybody within the school system. And then of course, 1B and 1C, those tiers have very large populations of people. Um, so, but we know that that death rate does go up in those people 75 years of age and over. And our goal is also to vaccinate those who may require higher levels of care at the hospital. Um, the hospital has generally about six to eight open IC, or six to eight ICU beds. Uh, oftentimes they're not open, but they generally have six to eight ICU beds depending upon staffing and, and whatnot. And so it would be important for us to minimize that strain on our ICU because at times we've actually been, it's been very difficult to get some of those people sent up the road the higher level care centers like Maryland, Hopkins, George Washington, those places. Um, so far, four pharmacies in the area have COVID vaccination programs. Uh, in general, they get 100 to 150 doses. And again, it's split between federal and state allocations. One of the questions that I got from, um, from this group was, you know, this question of whether or not we could do half doses. Thus far, we would not recommend that. Many ideas have been floated to us about half doses, spacing out doses to greater lengths, you know, so that we can get more bang for our buck um, or eliminating the second dose altogether. And so far, none of these strategies have been adopted by anyone at the state level, county level, anywhere that I know of. In clinical trials, people did accidentally, I think, got a half dose of Moderna vaccination. Um, and so those people were followed for the immune response. So. Um, part of the trial is tracking their immune response in terms of inflammatory markers and such, but the information gathered on half doses for that portion of the Moderna trial were not sufficient to pre prevent actual disease. So at this point, it's not recommended to have any doses. So I'm going to open it up. I'm going to try to see if I can go ahead and unmute people. So let me, um, no, how do I unmute? We can unmute ourselves. I there think. we go. There we go. Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. Very good. And, and I have a question um, already. Good. Yep. So I know these um, vaccinations have to be refrigerated. So how are they handling that? Are they? Is it a one dose and you just pull out the one dose you need for that person, or are they multi? Like in a, in a bottle, you have to. How is that? Yep. Yeah. So Moderna comes in vials uh, that would supply ten total uh, doses. Um, occasionally you can draw off an 11th dose, although it's very unreliable. 
Um, and so the Moderna vaccination actually can be stored in um, regular freezers type storage. Um, and, and so we really haven't had a problem with the Moderna storage uh, protocols. Pfizer does require that sub-zero freezer currently and thankfully the hospital has um, a sub-zero freezer and we have been able to share that space with them. And so if we get allotments of Pfizer, which I will be honest with you, we've really only received a one time, um, well, now we're getting the second doses, but we really haven't seen a whole lot of Pfizer come through this county. The majority of our vaccination has been Moderna predominantly. Uh, Pfizer was what we rolled out to certain groups. We felt that it was strategically easier to get those people in the school system vaccinated with Pfizer. So um, we did use predominantly Pfizer for them. And that was because we wanted to expedite that second dose uh, with that 21 day interval, we're able to get two doses in within three weeks and that can expedite potentially the ability to get them to, you know, kind of have full protection. So um, we did that, that's been our mainstay. If we get Pfizer, which again is not super frequent, but the Pfizer vaccination goes to the hospital, the hospital stores it, and then we pull out what allotment we may need. So if we know we're going out to do, say we're going to the schools and they're gonna be doing Pfizer doses, we know how many people they're doing, we calculate up how many doses they're gonna need. For Pfizer, um, initially we were being told that there was only five doses per vial and pretty reliably, like a large percentage of the population of the time, we were getting six doses. And then extremely rarely we were getting seventh doses, but um, it, you know, it has to be mixed and everything. So, um, so reliably people can get six doses out of a Pfizer vial. So that has increased the ability to vaccinate more people. Um, so that's kind of how we deal with it. Um, uh, we do have an entire team of wonderful nurses that work on these things with us. And so they are really truly the, um, the workforce behind all of this. You know, they come in, they get, they get the shipments in, they store things, they keep inventory. On days that we're doing the clinics over at the drive through site, they're responsible for how to get it over there, how to store it when it's there, um, all that sort of thing. So they're really our are really our backbone for um, this vaccination effort. But the pharmacies don't have those kind of storage facilities, right? I mean, usually I, the pharmacy, I just see a regular refrigerator. I don't see any kind of freezers in a, in a pharmacy like Giant or Walgreens. Right, right. So I think that um, some of them probably do because I don't know how they could store it otherwise. So CVS, because I talked with CVS pharmacists this week and they do get Pfizer directly from the federal government. So my assumption is that they either were required to purchase a sub-zero freezer, which I don't know how they would do that, um, or maybe they already had it in some way, shape or form, or maybe CVS purchased it and from the top down, they were able to allocate it to different sites. Um, so I know that they are getting Pfizer vaccination. It's a great question. And if I have the time to circle back with that pharmacist, she was lovely, by the way, Casey at CV CVS Dunkirk. Um, but she um, she sort of walked me through what their processes usually are. So. So it might be uh, that they do have a sub-zero freezer. I'm not quite sure. That's the kind of questions I'm getting is that, how do I know that my dose that I'm receiving has been properly stored so that I know I'm going to get the correct immunization from this virus? What if it right. was not stored properly? What if I got it when it was too warm? Right. Those are the questions I'm getting. Yeah, and I actually just thought about this and I don't know if any of our nurses are on. I know Mary is, and I don't know if Mary deals from this hospital. I do remember there being with Pfizer, there is, um, you can replenish dry ice twice at least in the original shipping container. So there is a very real possibility because if they book all of those appointments up within a matter of days, then they're getting rid of that allotment within that five day window that they have to turn over that um, dry ice. So I think that might be their, their way around it, their workaround. And that may be why they're getting such small dose allotments is because if they know that they can ship 150 to a store and 150 are gonna go in a matter of five days, that's easy enough for those um, pharmacies. So, yeah, but I, I can, can guarantee you that, uh, Mary, thank you. Oh, thank you I'm for sorry. sharing. You might be able to I, speak on I can that. answer a little bit of Trish's question, I think. So in addition to what you just explained, which was very, very good and very helpful, um, the, of course, we're doing the vaccination clinics both on site of the hospital and out in the community. So we're moving them out of that pharmacy storage, but the temperature is monitored the whole time. 
and we do have dry ice supply that we can use. And just like with any other QC process that, that you're doing, some of you are very used to that, when it's taken out of that deep freeze storage, it's dated and timed. And there's a time frame that you can then store it in the refrigerator and you write that date and time on there. And then there, once you take it out of there and it's, at, it's sitting in the room at room temperature, there's a window of time by which it's considered still good. And so we write the date and we write that time on there. So we're, it's constant monitoring and constant labeling of the vials with these uh, different dates and times so that we are watching and, and looking at that to make sure that they're in those different um, phases of temperature for that, those, um, requ those required pe periods of time. And we make sure that, I don't know if Tammy's still on, um, I think she is, I, and I, I know her. I'm here. The, the nurses are so good and the staff that's helping them the, the, do the logistics behind the scene to make sure that, hey, if we open a vial and there's 10 doses in there and we've only got nine people in here, we got to get another person in here to use this up. So, yep, that's great. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Uh, uh, another, I and, hope that stays that way that, you know, as we've progressed through the vaccination period, I hope that they stay on top of it. That's, that's really good. Another thing about that real quick, I, and Mary touched upon this, you're right, the nurses, so one of our nurses actually, or maybe multiple, they have a program on their phone because there's a, a monitor that goes into the freezer. And if there's any disruption, and that goes for the vaccine refrigerator, I think as well, but if there's any disruption or say there was a power outage, which shouldn't happen at a county run uh, building because you should have a generator. But anyways, if that happens, we get an alert and then there's an immediate response that goes into action. So thank you, Mary. I appreciate you chiming in. That was helpful. Um, I could, and this is Erin. I could ask. Oh, yes. Hi, Erin. Yes. Hey, <laughs> it's your speech. Um, uh, uh, wonderful talk. Uh, if I thank could you. add to when we go into the community from our standpoint, we have a very special vaccine refrigerator that monitors our temperatures as well. And we are very specific. Those vaccines don't come out of that refrigerator until a certain period of time before we're going to administer them. And the same thing, everything's dated and timed, and we're very careful. And I know that we hear a lot of these stories about vaccines going bad or thrown out, or that in the end, when you have extras, you just give it to anybody. I'm telling you, that's not happening in Calvert County. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is not happening in Calvert County. That's we true. are absolutely, I have to say that sometimes <laughs> we are there for two extra hours to make sure that we find the qualified people to use those extra doses. And the health department does as well. Yes. I remember in the beginning them staying until hours and hours later to make sure that only the population that were allowed to get those vaccines got those vaccines. Yes. If yes. I could just pop in for a second, I just want yeah. to mention that I've been up to the the site there um, uh, in the industrial park four times uh, with with uh, different people taking them to get their shots because they're they're over that 75 mark, and I have been everybody remarks about how efficient and how kind and how great it is to go in there and get your shot. Um, I, I you know I haven't gotten mine yet. I'm, Jim and I are hoping to get it soon so we can even start traveling eventually. But um, but yes, I, I can tell you that it's been very efficient, very quick, very easy. And uh, the biggest problem that I had was getting two 90 year olds on for registration. So we yes. did do that. But, yes. um, you know, if, you, if, if they just have a little bit of help to get them through the registration process, um, you know, on their computer, then that yes. was half the battle. Yep, and we, we've made, so over the last week, um, one of the things we heard was that exact frustration. Um, so, you know, we have about five nurses or so, sometimes more at various mm -hmm. times of the day, um, calling some of these members of the community that have called our community health line at the health department mm -hmm. who might have been not able to navigate the link or, uh, or something like this. And so um, our community health, team basically tries to tackle and either work with them so that they can register on their computers, which a lot of people prefer to do, or 
you know, we, if they really can't make it work, we certainly try to register them on our own. Um, but it is, it's a Herculean task to do that, obviously. Um, so, and, and I appreciate your feedback about the, the drive-through. I think we probably started talking about the drive-through in September. I mean, the, these discussions were not, um, you know, quick lickety split. Uh, we had to sort of come up with these game plans ahead of time. And it's been very helpful to work with the team that has been through the H1N1 uh, flu vaccination clinics down at the fairgrounds. I mean, some of these nurses have been around for a long enough period of time that they knew some of the pitfalls and some of the benefits of each you know, way of doing things. So we appreciate that. I do see that in the chat box, one of the, uh, somebody uh, commented, what are the infection rates by area of the county? And I did just take a look at the most recent stats for that. And let me pull them up real quick. So right now, the percent positivity in the north end of the county is 3.99%. Um, over the past week, we had 22 positives in that end of the county. The central portion um, had a lower positivity rate of 3.57%. We had a total of 26 uh, people there. And then the south end of the county is positive at 29 cases, 4.01% positivity rate. So overall, well below that 5% mark that we typically get concerned about. The only times that we've seen really large deviations from generally about equitable percent positivity rates are um, when we have very large gatherings. Uh, we had a string of weddings in the southern portion of the county in late August, I want to say it was, and, or early September, and we saw a very, very marked sway. All the positives were basically in that area. So, um, so it's just very important to be mindful that sometimes those things uh, do play a huge role in what's happening. And just we know Calvert County is generally a small county, but even where you live, it makes a huge difference how people are acting because it does spread quite drastically from there. Um, so uh, we, we've been very fortunate. We, we understand that there's a, the benefit of being in Calvert County. When I, when all this first started, um, when I was seeing patients, you know, I said, one of the benefits is that we have some space. Many of us have the ability to have a home where we can walk into different rooms or get a little space from our family members if we need a little time, or we can go out and go for a walk. Um, and in many places, large, you know, cities and places like that, the, the opportunity to do that is not, not there. Where I trained in Philadelphia, I literally got off out of my, my house, my, my apartment, and I went right onto an elevator with lots of other people. And so some people really had to, um, had to suffer some consequences uh, of the restrictions that might have been in place. So thankfully, we've got the ability to stretch our legs and to interact with people um, as best we can um, nowadays, so. Uh, I had a quick uh, sure. treatment question. Yes. Uh, for somebody with mild symptoms, disease, monoclonal antibody referrals, does that have to come from their primary care provider? How's that work and where do they go? So now they can go to the emergency room. It is being done in the emergency room and Aaron's still on the call. Mary had to get off, but um, so Aaron may actually know a bit more about the process within the hospital system. That is where they're being administered. Um, before that, they were having to go quite a bit up the road or I think maybe even um, MedStar Southern Maryland Hospital Center was doing monoclonal antibody therapy. But yes, yeah, so you do have to get a referral from a provider I don't know if you can go directly to the emergency room and be seen and then still get the monoclonal antibodies from there. So I'll have to circle back with that one unless Aaron um, has input on that one. I was just wondering how sick do they have to be? How All right, if there's criteria. Well, I mean, there there is criteria, uh, but you know, when you do come to the emergency room, they are making a determination. Do you meet criteria to be admitted or uh, are you still, you're sick, but well enough to be at home. So I think there are two ways that you're getting that therapy is that you're coming to the emergency room because uh, you need some help or some assistance. And then that decision is being made based on your particular symptoms and, and what's going on with you and your previous medical experience. And I do think it also is happening based on uh, people with 
reaching out to their primaries or specialty doctors, and they're getting that referral that way into the, into that clinic as well. I actually, we call her the BAM nurse and uh, she is with us Monday through Friday, five days a week. Her name is Ashley and she is delightful. And she's actually right now, because some days she doesn't have anybody, she's working the, infu- the uh, immunization clinics with us. So I've got to meet her and know her. We call her the BAM nurse. She's young and enthusiastic. And we're so excited because, you know, uh, there's a lot of communities that don't have this option. And there's a lot of places that you're having to travel pretty far for this. So big kudos to Kara Hara, the head of our pharmacy, for getting all the paperwork, getting all the red tape slash. So this is an opportunity for our people here in Calvert County. So I definitely say that this makes a difference. What I have heard is that individuals who receive that treatment, which it's 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 a around a 30 minute infusion and they have you stay for about two hours afterwards and then you go home. But I have heard that people who've had their treatment that uh, in two days, they feel markably different, much, much improvement. And this is being studies are showing that this is really cutting the symptoms and the time and, and most importantly, preventing you from becoming sicker and having to be admitted. So uh, yeah. definitely a great thing that we've got going on. Yeah. So my question did, is, is, it re- is it reasonable for somebody that has uh, a very mild cough and maybe sinus congestion They're five days in, and then they're worried about, well, geez, in another five days, am I going to have to be rushed to the hospital because my O2 is down? So can that person at five days with that degree, that little, those few symptoms get the monoclonal antibody? Uh, and I, I'm not sure. I know that um, I did just look back while Aaron was speaking. I looked at Dr. Polsky's email that came out about it a, a, maybe a couple of weeks ago. So the way that doctors' offices can refer is through CRISP, that CRISP portal through the state. And CRISP actually has the criteria listed. So I think that, and I have not done this because obviously I've not referred anybody for therapy. But Dr. Trilla, what I'll do is I'll look to see on CRISP maybe, and, and I'll let you know. Um, sort of what they have people checking off in terms of check boxes. But certainly it's good to know that we have that therapy here in our community uh, because for quite some time that was not even a reality. Right. Good. No, it is good. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess if nobody else has any questions and feel free, you know, I, I didn't put it in my, um, my slides or anything. But my email address, um, if anybody wants to jot that down, it's michelle.folsom, that's F as in Frank, O-L, S as in Sally, O-M, hyphen elder, E-L-D-E-R, at Maryland, the whole word spelled out, dot gov. Um, And so you can shoot me an email anytime. I I generally um, am open to responding to emails all the time. The best time for me to respond to emails is after I put my kids to bed. I have three kids that are under six um, and then a teenager as well. So we're quite busy. So once I get the kids asleep is really when I do the bulk of my emailing. Um, So, but if you ever need to send me an email, um, please feel free. And uh, obviously I look forward to um, meeting you guys, hopefully in real life at some point um, so that we can uh, chat and, and touch base there. So. Is it Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E? Two L's. Yes, Great. ma'am. Yep. yep. That's it. Yep. Um, if anybody wants any information um, that was uh, given tonight, then I can certainly share it with them as well. Most of you know my email by now. Um, but, um, and, if, uh, and if anybody has any extra questions, we can always forward them to Dr. Folsom. Yep, yep absolutely. And, and some of them you know, I'll need to get from Dr. Polsky, you know, some of the questions can sometimes be above my head, well above my, you know, what they call my pay grade, right? Um, so uh, that's why we're having this tonight is because it's all above my pay grade. Believe me. <laughs> Kathy, Greer, did you have a question? Michelle, if you could right click on the screen and give me on my picture and give me control back before you leave. Yes, on your picture. I'm looking for you. Okay. I'm up here in the top row. <laughs> More. Oops. Since Middleham, St. Peter's. 
Yeah, That's okay, I'm going, I'm going. We'll see if I can find you there. You were on my main screen. So right. I think that's, I think that happened. And then just go to there and right, say. Right. And it says host. That pull on one sec. Oh man, you just keep moving all over the place. The <laughs> people are dropping. Into my world. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> before everybody gets off also, I do want to thank um, Calvary Bible, um, St. John Vianney, um, First Lutheran, uh, the hospital, the, the health department, and um, and, and a lot of people from Middleham and St. Peter's that have popped on um, to the program. I, I hope we can do something like this again in the future. Maybe this subject, maybe a different subject. Um, this year, we've tried to focus mostly, uh, most of our information has been on COVID, the vaccine, and also mental health. Um, those have been our, our big topics of conversation. So um, I think that we know that this has been pretty successful today, and I hope to do this again in the future. And I thank everyone for coming on, um, parish, the uh, health ministry people, um, Aaron and and, um, and Mary and everybody. Thank you very much for your help yes. as well. And thank you for pulling together, Dale. Really appreciate it. It was very helpful. Yeah, thank That's you. Fun. Thanks, Dale. Thanks, Michelle. It's great. Thank yeah, you thank much. you. <laughs> And, 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 oh, one more plug, one more thing. If anybody wants to volunteer, um, please email me, okay? You don't need to volunteer to give vaccinations. You can volunteer to say hi to people or whatever. Um, we don't, we, we want this to be a community effort in many ways. Um, so if you know someone that wants to volunteer, if you want to volunteer, um, just email me and one of our nurses will be in touch with you. There's a form that you have to complete and a license that we just have to get your driver's license. And, and really that's kind of it. So um, if you get to the point where you feel like you, you're called to do that, please you know, let me know for sure. All right, so if there's, if there's nothing else, then we'll go ahead and sign off for tonight. Um, like I said, many thanks again to Dr. Folsom and to our crew to, that helps to put these things together. Thank you all yeah. very much. Thank you. Very Thank, you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.